Five, four, three, two. Hey everyone, uh, we're, we're here today. Uh, I'm, I'm here with Priscilla and Dr. Bonnie Maldonado, uh, who's the, the chair of infectious disease for, for uh, pediatrics at Stanford. Um, before that was uh, earlier in her career was a fellow at the CDC uh, right around the time when HIV uh, was, was uh, really growing as an outbreak. Um, and we have a lot of different topics that we want to cover. I want to um, start off by um, uh, apologizing. We had an issue with the stream before, um, so we're, we're restarting this, and, and hopefully it'll be a bit smoother this time. Um, but I, I figured it was, it's probably good to, to start off uh, by going through um, some news that Bonnie had this week, uh, which is that she's leading a team across Stanford and uh, and, and some folks at UCSF uh, to do a um, pretty meaningful size uh, test, a serology test and, and PCR test over a, a nine month period uh, to track the rates of infection uh, and rates of exposure and how that evolves across the Bay Area uh, to, to answer a number of questions that we don't know the answers to um, around how uh, COVID spreads and, and and how it behaves. So, Bonnie, maybe you could just start off by uh, telling us a little bit about the study that you're that you're doing and and what we hope to learn from it. And I guess maybe just to uh, make sure that everyone uh, kind of has a sense of the basic ideas here. I mean, may, maybe kick us off with, with explaining, you know, just what what a serology test is and a PCR test and and, mm -hmm. and all that. Yeah. So uh, the PC we're going to be looking at PCR testing and serology testing. Basically, PCR testing is a way where you can actually um, look for an organism in a person's body. So in this case, you've been taking a swab, a nasal swab, and looking for uh, evidence of that, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus or the COVID disease uh, virus in that swab. And the way you do it is you look for a gene. Uh, uh, there's a test, it's called PCR. And that test just takes a particular gene that's specific to that organism, and it multiplies it millions and millions of times in a machine so that you can detect that organism. And now we have that test available at Stanford and UCSF so that we can get a test result within 12 to 24 hours. So it's really rapid and it's very reliable. So that can tell you if you're infected with that virus right this minute. Um, the other uh, test is the serology. It's basically a blood test. And what that is, is it measures proteins called antibodies. And antibodies are um, proteins that your body makes uh, that are directed against uh, bacteria, viruses, anything that invades the body. Um, and those antibodies can sometimes protect you if you see that disease again. So if you get sick now, you develop antibodies, you might be protected the next time you see that virus. And so we're going to be trying to, we're going to be testing two populations. One is the general population that represents everybody um, in the six Bay Area regions that we've picked out, San Mateo, Santa Clara, San Francisco, Marin, Contra Costa, and Alameda. And we'll be, have a representative sample of people based on a lot of important demographic groups so that we can track how many people have COVID in, in infection with the virus that causes COVID um, at the baseline and also look for their antibodies to this disease. So hopefully we'll be able to find out right away how many people are infected and how many people have been infected. And since we know the virus hasn't been around that long, it will mean that they have been probably infected in the last two to three months. Um, and then what the exciting part too, well then we'll be able to follow those people over time at once a month so that we can see if there are new infections happening over time in the whole Bay Area. So that as we go through the next few months with Governor Newsom's and the public health department's plans to change, um, get us back to kind of a normal situation, we can track and see what's the baseline rate of infection now and is it going up or staying the same and hopefully going down over time. And if there are hot spots, we'll be able to identify those in real time because the tests are results are back very quickly and we can give those results to the county health departments. So that's the one test study. And the other one will be a sub-study among healthcare workers that is very similar, except we're also gonna be focusing on some very special 
um, antibody tests to understand the nature of those antibodies. Are they protective? Do they protect you from infection? Do they protect you from disease? That is, you could become infected but not get sick. Um, and we need we can hopefully be able to distinguish between those two. And then finally, if you get antibodies and they are protective, how long will they last? Because that might be important to know for the next time the virus comes back, if it does. Yep. And we, with these tests, um, there's a lot of talk around, we see all different numbers reported. Um, so uh, I'd love to, you know, we, I read that New York has 20% seropositivity. Like, what is that? Are there any practical implications of what that means for New York? And yes. can you talk a little bit about false positives and false negatives here? Sure. Well, before we talk about that, let me t explain to you why false positives are important. Um, and they're really more important at a population level because basically what they mean is you test somebody, it would be like saying I have, you know, you're testing somebody for the presence of uh, antibodies, for example. And uh, there, there is always going to be a little bit of error in some of these tests for a lot of error. And what we're finding is that there's a lot of error in some tests. Now, we know that Stanford and UCSF tests are very, very um, accurate. So very few false positives and false negatives. But let me just give you an example. If you had 100 people who um, you wanted to test and you knew that 50% of the people were infected and you knew that the test you used had a 5% false positive rate, that would mean that if you tested those 100 people, you'd get 55 positives. Five, 50 of them would be real positives and five of them would be false positives. Now you don't know which ones they are. You just know that's the way the test works. So that's five out of 55 uh, people. So about 10% of the people would actually be false positives. So that's not great, but if, let's just say the number of people in your population actually only has 5% infection. And we think that's where we are with COVID right now in the US as a whole. That would mean that if you had 5% infected, that five people would test positive and it would be really infected. And another five would test positive because the test has a 5% false positive rate. And that means that 50% of your um, test results are false positives. So the false positive rate doesn't change, but the proportion of population changes. And that's why you need a really accurate test because if you're not using a very accurate test, then you are gonna, you're gonna overrepresent the number of infected people in a population. And that's a problem because you might uh, underestimate the number of deaths. So for example, if you say, well, look, you know, 50% of the people are infected and yet we only have X number of deaths, that must mean the, the number of people dying relative to the number infected is very low. And so you want all those things to be as accurate as possible. And that's why our tests are very accurate. And not only that, if we get false, well, if we get positives either by PCR or by uh, the blood test, we're gonna actually uh, tr trade samples with each other so we can run the test again with the other person, other is UCSF and Stanford's test. So having the test done by two places by two different methods will even further ensure that we're not seeing false positives. Yes, there's so, a lot of questions that people have about what what does having antibodies mean? Um, and there are a lot of questions that still need to get answered. Um, you know, if you have antibodies, does that uh, prevent you from getting the disease again? Um, how long do the antibodies last for if they, if they provide some kind of immunity? Um, do they prevent you from spreading it to other people? Um, how are you planning on using the studies that you're running to help answer those questions? Yeah, so um, we're expecting that most people are not going to ha ever have a positive PCR or a positive antibody test. That's why we need to look at so many people. Um, we need to test about 7,500 people a month, uh, in a, same people over time, because we think the number of, of positives is going to be low. But among those positives, we'll be able to track over time uh, whether um, they get reinfected, for example, if somebody has an antibody that's positive, um, will they later on, if let's just say the virus comes back or it starts to you know, have a seasonality to it, we can see if people who have antibodies are less likely to be infected again than people who don't have antibodies. And we'll also be able to see how long the antibodies last. And then finally, in the laboratories of our scientists at Stanford and UCSF, they're gonna do some other tests with the actual virus itself to see if they can determine how well the virus protects um, the, um, the, uh, protects, the 
protects from getting the infection into human cells in a, in a, in a laboratory setting. So this could pave the way, um, among others, for looking at well, how a vaccine might work down the line. Interesting. Well, I mean, you asked this question a second ago about what do the population level exposure numbers mean? Um, you know, it, it, we've seen some of the numbers coming out of New York that um, serology tests there have shown that up to 20% of people might have been um, exposed. Um, and there's a preprint that uh, our, our team flagged coming out of Italy in Lombardy showing that potentially 60% of the population in Lombardy um, has been exposed. What, what do those numbers mean for public health and how would um, understanding that level of exposure inform the type of um, public health decisions that governments and, and local officials need to make? Well, the very first thing it tells you is what's the degree of protection, what, what's the degree of protection you need to have what we call herd immunity, right? So, so we use vaccines, for example, to give people immunity to diseases so that when there is a random case of an infection, there's so many people who are protected that you basically only have one or two cases and then there's nobody else will get infected and the disease stops spreading. The reason we're seeing so much COVID is because nobody has ever seen this virus before. So it's just spreading from one person to the other. The only way you can stop that is to have people who have immunity or to keep people apart. And so with this particular virus, given the transmissibility, we think that you need to have at least 60 to 80% of people with immunity in order to stop it from spreading. We don't want 60 to 80% of people in the US or the world to get this disease so we can stop it from spreading. So that means we have to do other things like keeping people apart. And um, so that's why that number is so important. And we know that, for example, in Lombardy, where there was a particularly high out, big outbreak, and maybe in parts of New York, there may be higher rates of infection. Um, I know that a very high rate in one German town was about 15%. So 60% sounds extremely high to me, but that might have been in a very small community, for example, where lots of people were exposed to one another very early. But I would say that in the US, uh, it would be very unusual for us to see more than, say, a 5% infection rate across the US right now which makes it really scary to think, well, you need 60% of us to be immune, to have immunity in order to stop this from spreading all the time. So that's why a vaccine is gonna be really, really important or drugs that people can take to reduce the amount of virus uh, that, is, uh, that, the, that is replicating in their body. So, um, so to keep that from, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna take a moment to say, remind uh, as pediatricians, um, uh, COVID is not the only thing that we're trying to protect the community from and that, that we have existing vaccines in which we've reached herd immunity uh, levels at through vaccinations. And you had raised this point earlier. Yeah, absolutely. So we have to, I, I, I'm a pediatrician as well. And I, I know that uh, a lot of people, we have seen record numbers of uh, under vaccinated kids in the last uh, month or two. And I understand why people are um, afraid to go outside with their kids or afraid to, um, maybe they might be afraid to go to their doctor's office. And in fact, the American Academy of Pediatrics has suggested that we really focus on the first two years of life rather than the older kids and just wait a few months until the older kids can come back for their well child visits. But we, you need to make sure that those young babies get their normal vaccines because we still have other viruses and bacteria around that can infect children. So we wanna make sure that, um, that people come back, they talk to their, their doctors, they get their vaccines. Um, it's really what pediatricians do best. So I agree. Yeah, I we, mean, don't that's a, that's a good call. we don't want to have a. We don't want to have a. We don't lose the herd immunity on um, right. on the other diseases that we've already done right. this hard work. Um, exactly. Is there anything else that on on kids uh, that 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 you think is not particularly um, well understood uh, by 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 people at this point about how the disease works and. Um, I mean, it's it, one of the fortunate things about it seems to be that kids don't get the worst um, symptoms as, 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 as much. 
Um, but, but what are the big questions that are still open and what do you want to make sure that people know about this? Well, I have to say that, unfortunately, we know almost nothing about this disease in children. I think, and I think part of it is because we've been so overwhelmed with taking care of the adults, um, but nobody, and we were afraid to have, you know, we, schools closed down very quickly because as we talked about, we needed to socially distance. So we haven't really had a chance to look at how, what happens to children. As far as we understand so far around the world, um, it doesn't look like kids um, have a very high rate of infection or else they're not have, they don't seem to have a very high rate of disease. That is, they might be getting infected, it's possible, but they don't seem to have a lot of symptoms. Now, that's all very anecdotal um, and there have been very few studies right, to date in children so we are doing some studies ourselves here at Stanford. I'm doing a study looking at household transmission to see what's going on with kids um, and adults as well. But um, there's a lot we need to understand. And I think one of the key things that we could understand about kids that could help everybody is if children really aren't getting infected, why is that? Because almost every disease that we know of um, really affects a uh, child that is widespread, usually it affects children first because they're outside, they're putting dirt in their mouths, they're not washing their hands, they can't control their secretions very well, and they're all huddled together usually. So they're very good at spreading infectious diseases. Um, why are they not getting sick? We don't know the answer to that. That might be helpful. Or the other question would be, let's just say they are getting infected, but they're not getting sick. That would also be important to know because then we could figure out, well, if they're not getting symptoms, maybe we could use that same mechanism to prevent older people from not getting symptoms as well. So there's a lot we can learn from children and we have, we've been trying, um, but right now all of the, most of the federal agencies are really focusing and rightly so on just the people who are getting hospitalized and vent, uh, put on ventilators. And those are mostly older adults. We so do know one thing, we do know that kids are, um, we're seeing some evidence of inflammatory reactions in children. So things like, um, um, we're, we know that young adults are starting to see, we're starting to see strokes in younger, older, young adults. Mm -hmm. And we're also seeing uh, that kids are getting these um, funny rashes and, um, some fevers um, and other symptoms. So What's we're not really- age range when you say young adult? Um, I th in their 20s to 40s. So yeah, in the age range where we don't think people are getting that sick. So they're not getting that sick, but then later on, um, they seem to be having later onset complications. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's one of the big open questions is, yeah. you know, to the extent that people survive, do, do they have long-term damage um, and to, to different organs or, or different things? And I, I, that, that I guess will need to be studied over time. Um, so you've studied a lot of different diseases, right? I mean, you, you, you spent a long time um, working on polio and, and you know, some of the work around vaccines there. I'm, I'm curious what, what experiences um, that, you, that you've had either fighting polio or fighting HIV uh, that you think are transferable or, or could teach us lessons about um, this fight against COVID? Well, let me start with the social aspects, right? So the social piece of it is um, I'm actually still, so I'm surprised that even in this day and age, we're seeing a lot of fear and anxiety. So I know that I've seen from other countries, hopefully not so much here, but people are afraid of healthcare workers. They've been uh, I've heard of reports of healthcare workers being harassed or um, uh, uh, beat up um, uh, because they're afraid that they're going to be spreading the disease. And, and that's actually unfortunate because those are our first responders. Um, and I, I remember the HIV days when people were afraid to treat patients who had HIV. I used to have to go every day and give talks to the nurses and the doctors and explain to them that all of the evidence we had suggested that these, these diseases were not easily transmitted to people unless they had exposure to blood or blood products, et cetera. And I feel like that might be happening a little bit today. So I wouldn't say that the fear and anxiety is at the same level, but it's the generalized fear. Everybody's afraid. And I think we need to be cautious. I do think we need to be careful, but I think we should not be afraid of other people. Um, and, uh, and so that's one of the things I've learned. The other thing I've learned is that um, this, this virus is very similar in that uh, um, 
the the most the most symptomatic people are probably going to be a very small proportion of the whole group of people. So this is going to be like an, a pyramid. I think what we're seeing is the tip of the iceberg or the tip of the pyramid. And there's going to be a lot of people who are probably not getting symptoms. Now, the only good news here for us compared to HIV is that HIV took 10 or 12 years before you could actually get really, really sick. And this disease is moving much faster. So we should be able to understand more about the baseline of people. And then if we can understand that, we have a better shot at treating those people for their infections so that they don't spread it to others. That's very similar to the polio story where most people with polio uh, don't get sick at all and they're actually spreading the disease to other people. And in that case, when that happens, you need to vaccinate everybody because you just can't pick up everybody who's infected. How will we know if if you have that, we talked about serologies, how will we know if you, ha if you have, in fact, have their antibodies, whether or not it actually stops you from passing it on to someone else like in polio? Well, unfortunately, the only way you're gonna know, you could do some lab tests. So for example, you could take the virus, mix it with antibodies, and then try to see if it infects cells. And if, and if uh, the antibodies prevent the cells from getting infected, then you know, at least in test tubes, that it seems to be protective, but ultimately you just have to give it to people and see if they are more or less likely to get infected. So it's gonna be a risky. I think you're gonna to have to have really good lab evidence that it works in the laboratory and maybe even in animal models. So for example, the very early study you might've heard about from, I think, is it earlier this week? Uh, somebody told me they're called a blurs days now. I can't remember what day it was, but it may have been yesterday or the day before, don't know. Anyway, there was a day sometimes recently where uh, the UK um, scientists had a vaccine against a virus that's related. It's called MERS or Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. It's, very, it's another coronavirus. They had already been working on that vaccine. So they were able to retool it very quickly so that they could uh, put in some of the, pro the genes for proteins from this virus, from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And they tested it in, in, in uh, they had a lot of data on safety already from the other experiments. So they were able to put this virus, vaccine virus into six rhesus monkeys. And those monkeys were actually fully protected from getting sick from the SARS-CoV-2. So now they're rapidly moving in to more animal and human studies. So they're hoping that they can scale it up more, very quickly. And so I think uh, it will be interesting to see in, if you do animal studies that where an animal can has a very similar disease uh, outcome as we do, if that works really well, then we can start using it in people. We have a question here about from Han. Um, how, uh, or actually uh, from Taryn, when you create a vaccine for a virus, doesn't a virus change? How do you actually create a, vi a vaccine to something that's always changing? That's a great question. Um, so yeah, so RNA and DNA viruses mutate all the time. It turns out that RNA viruses mutate faster than DNA viruses for a lot of, they're just the way they're built. Um, but this RNA virus has a special, um, unusual mechanism that allows it to, for some reason, it doesn't mutate that more, that, that as quickly as other RNA viruses. So um, we know that this virus mutates more slowly just from studying over three to 4,000 species, samples of these viruses over time and looking at their genetic sequences and we know that they haven't been uh, spreading over time um, uh, or mutating over time. And so um, we've been very fortunate that way. We think it'll be very similar, but even other viruses, like for example, measles virus, we think measles virus has mutated a bit over many, many years, but yet the same vaccine that we used in the 50s and 60s is still effective against measles that we see today. So even though, so there are parts of the virus that never really change or, or change very little. And that's generally the, where the vaccines are directed against the parts that are conserved the most highly and less likely to mutate. But that's yeah. true, theoretically, theoretically, you could have a, vac a virus that eventually mutates away. That's why we have to invent a new flu vaccine every year. Yeah, one thing that's interesting um, is uh, that we've talked about with Joe DeRisi's lab is that um, you can track these mutations and it's sort of like a genetic fingerprint and traces where these uh, viral strains are going, coming from. 
And I, I think that's uh, something important to see that it's coming from all over the world. And um, we see different strains coming from Europe and Asia and different parts of the United States. Um, and it's related to that fear idea that you were talking about that was so prevalent. And uh, my point is related to the fear that was so present in um, HIV. I think a, a lot of people are... Um, were, uh, uh, fear is triggering stereotypes and different acts of racism. And I think the science tells us that actually the coronavirus is coming from all over the world. Yes. Is well, that, you is know, that your experience in looking at the next strain data as well? Yeah. And I think that's the issue. You know, we, uh, in my feed, I, again, as you mentioned, I trained at CDC and I've been working in global health for almost all of my career, as well as in the U S and, it was just a matter of time. It would have come from anywhere. I think, you know, putting people together with animals that we've never seen before in changing climates, all of these things, kind of you roll them together and you're going to have, you know, random mutations occur at the wrong time and you can see something like this. Look what happened with Zika, for example. That, you know, you, you don't want to really... Um, you learn one thing is that we're a global community now. If we weren't global a uh, hundred years ago, we certainly are now. And I think we all, we're all on this planet together. So, and, you know, I don't think anybody would purposely, despite what we've heard, nobody's purposely made this virus. So um, these things just happen. Uh, they, we have, for example, the U.S. is one of the places where we see lots of antibiotic resistance because we use antibiotics all the time that make our bacteria mutate. So, uh, we shouldn't be blaming other people for things that just happen because of our own, be, that we might be doing as well in terms of breeding these resistance. What we need to do is approach these things scientifically and learn how to uh, undo them. So that's so a great point. So vaccine development for a second. I'm curious yeah. if you could give folks a sense of, of what you think that they should expect, right? I mean, there's a lot of um, timelines that are thrown out around oh, this, oh, this will be ready and you know, around the middle of, of uh, 2021, um, you know, as someone who's been involved in, in vaccine development and, you know, the complexities and the different types of vaccines that someone might uh, try to try to create here, um, you know, what are your expectations of what, what would happen and what should people overall, uh, how, how should they be thinking about this process? Yeah, so um, the vaccines take a long time. I mean, on average, a brand new vaccine that you just start from scratch. Now, remember, this vaccine already had a backbone built a long time ago. Um, it takes about 10 years and it takes, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to build out a vaccine because you want to make sure, first of all, that it's safe. And secondly, that it actually works um, and it works well. And sometimes we're willing to sacrifice um, effectiveness. That is, it might not work 100% of the time. No vaccine does, but it may not, you know, some vaccines may work 30% of the time. But at this point, if it worked 30% of the time, I think people would be willing to take it. But you need to make sure it's safe. And so um, that's really one of the issues that I think we need to think about here is um, where are we along that pipeline? And I know there are over 40 vaccine candidates that are out there right now, but most of them aren't even ready to be put into animals yet, much less humans. And those studies take a while because most of that is about safety. You want to make sure that they don't, you know, they don't have uh, negative effects that would be worse probably than the disease, than, than COVID. So those things generally take a while. And the UK vaccine shows a lot of promise and I think if they're going to share that platform, I'm sure they would share so that other people can start looking at other vaccines that would be very similar and building those out rapidly. So I do think that at least a year um, will we'll go by before we have anything that we think is safe enough to put into people. Um, but in the meantime, I think uh, there are a lot of other things we can do besides distancing, which is obviously important. But that would be looking at repurposed drugs, so other drugs that we have that are available that might work. It's interesting that this drug, the remdesivir, it works just pretty similarly to the way the HIV, original HIV drug works. So there's only so many mechanisms that a virus may respond to. We understand the way this virus works pretty well. So the idea would be to identify drugs that we think will work against different pathways that the virus takes to attach itself to a human cell, 
to replicate in the human cell and then to come out and infect other cells. So there are many pathways along the way where drugs could target those. And then you could use those drug targets um, as effective ways to prevent disease. We Again, coming back to your example of HIV, we, have, we still don't have an HIV vaccine, but we think we can control the disease just by using therapeutics. So that may be a way to get us through until there is a vaccine available. Maybe you can say a little bit more about remdesivir. Like, is everyone going to get it now uh, if, uh, if they're positive for coronavirus? Or who is it best used for and how, how much does it help? Yeah. Well, so <clears throat> the current trials were really um, done very rapidly, which is great, um, but they were very focused. So these were done in people who were already hospitalized and either had moderate or severe disease. And so the trials showed that um, that people who got remdesivir compared to placebo, meaning a, a sugar pill or just a, no drug at all, uh, but they were actually, they thought they might be get they had a 50-50 chance of getting some something. Um, uh, those trials showed that um, the people who got the remdesivir were uh, significantly less likely to progress and have poor, more serious disease, and they were also more likely to get better uh, over a shorter period of time. And there was a trend uh, towards decreased mortality as well um, in those patients. The other thing, the other study that was sh showed that um, that trial, the one that showed that decreased uh, Increased time, decreased time to be getting, getting better uh, was a study uh, of five days versus 10 days. Uh, it was a 10 day study of drug. And then there was a separate study looking at five versus 10 days of drug in severe disease. And in that study, they demonstrated that five days was just as good. So it, but it is an IV drug. So the question is, um, you know, really, what are you going to be? Yeah, you, you can't, you might be able to use it on the outpatient setting, but Mostly right now, what the FDA is doing is they have said it's going to be it should be used in people who are hospitalized with severe disease. And the good thing is they said children or adults, so okay. children could get it as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's and a so drug that it, can't be taken by mouth. It has to be given right. through. Right. Well, then there's. I'm sure they're going to. You know, I'm sure there will be efforts to see what how else you can formulate the drug and make it better or make it available on an outpatient setting or do other studies to look at outpatients or less, less people with less severe illness. So, but it's the first step to understanding that in fact, something does work because that gives people hope and that gives scientists a lot of information to go to the next set of drugs. We're already doing uh, two, two drug studies here at Stanford, uh, one on the outpatient side and another one on the inpatient side. And so, you know, and I know, I know other people are doing similar studies. Yeah, um, I think we only have a few more minutes. So I'm, I'm curious if there's anything else that you wanna make sure that we hit that we haven't so far. I, I wanna make sure people know that this is a really life changing moment. And if everyone feels like this is not normal, it, you're right, it isn't normal. This is a once in a century event. Um, but I think back about you know what happened with Ebola I worked in I worked in the DR Congo uh, during the Ebola epidemic. I didn't work on that. I worked on something else. Um, I worked in uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa on an HIV when 30% of pregnant women that I was working with had HIV disease, and we have made remarkable progress. And I want everyone to remember that um, this is uh, something that we can all get over. We need to just stick together and have hope and whatever it takes to get you back into a Zen kind of place, you should do, you know, as long as you're following the rules, um, just feel hopeful. Uh, I am a, I'm an optimist. I'm, I'm a pediatrician. So I guess that's part of being a pediatrician. I have hope for the future. And I think, think about it. We haven't really known about this virus for more than four months. And we've already got um, a vaccine that looks like it could work a drug that might work. It didn't, it took us so much longer for disease like HIV. So I think we're going to be uh, looking at some real progress in the next few months and pretty soon we'll be able to um, get, get outdoors and you can still get outdoors and get, you know, some fresh air and exercise. Um, and just, you know, keep your spirits up and, you know, trust, trust um, good uh, information sources like this. Yeah. Thank you. The work that you're doing and uh, others in your community, it gives me hope. So I really appreciate it. 
We all yeah. do. Thank you. Thank you for your, for your leadership. Right. We're, we're looking forward yeah. to, to following the study and we're, we're proud to support you in the work that you're doing. Well, thank you. We're very excited and thank you so much. All right. All right. Thank you. Great. See you soon. All right. Have a good weekend.